Welcome again. As Merry we Christmas. Continue on. Yes, Merry <laughs> Christmas. We continue on our Bible study. We're in Galatians chapter 5, but since it's so close to Christmas, I guess we ought to say a little bit about Christmas, hadn't we? <laughs> I think we should. <laughs> so, We've been saying it for almost the whole month. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, this is a special time of year, but, yes. you know, sometimes we get so focused on the baby in the manger uh, that we forget really the reason that Jesus came. Um, you know, been lots of babies, billions of babies born over the years, but there's only been one that was born for the specific purpose of dying for our sins. And that's, that's a big deal about his birth is the yes, fact it is, that Joe. it was God come in the flesh and I know people like to celebrate and, and, you know, have a good time at Christmas and have time with family. And that's, you know, it's wonderful. That's worth celebrating. Yes, it's worth celebrating. You know, God's all about family and all about uh, joy and peace and all those things. But let's not forget that the reason that Jesus came, it wasn't just to come down and show us uh, the right way to live or set a good example for us, although he certainly did that. Uh, it wasn't even just to teach us, which, again, he too. certainly did that, too. He did a lot of that. and uh, But the main reason he came, he was born to die, to die for our sins. You know, because God said that we're all under under the curse of sin because of the, the fall of, of man through Adam and Eve. We're all under that curse. And there had to be a penalty paid for that. And the only way to do it was, first of all, it had to be a human being that paid it, but it uh -huh. couldn't be a human being that came in the, in the ordinary sense, just like you and me, because we can't die for other people's sins. We, if we're no. going to die, it'd be for our own sins. Yeah. And so it had to be a perfect person, somebody that did not commit sin, somebody that was not born... Uh, in the normal human way, even though he was born of a woman, yet his father was not an earthly father, his father was God. Mm -hmm. And so that's a whole meaning of Christmas. And, uh, you know, like I say, it's great to get together with family. It's great to have, give gifts and, and uh, enjoy the season, but let's not forget what it's all about. It's all about Jesus coming to earth to, to be the, pay the sacrifice or to be the sacrifice for our sins. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us that we have to celebrate Christmas. Uh, in fact, if we get to the point where we feel like we have to to be saved or have to to get right with God, then, no, then we're going back to where yeah, Paul's talking the about wrong. the Galatians here. It's not because we have to, it's because we want to. We want yeah. to remember we want to remember the things that Jesus uh, did for us. We want to remember the fact that he gave up his place in heaven to come down here and be, uh, to suffer all the things that he did, to suffer the, the, the rejection and to suffer the uh, pain and agony that he went through and all those things that he had to go through as a human being. He didn't yeah. suffer. He didn't have those problems in heaven. We, we celebrate Christmas for the birth of Christ just like we celebrate the birth of any any human baby it's always a big deal we make a big deal out of mm -hmm. the birth of our children and our friends children and but Jesus is the major one uh, that was born yeah and well. whether it was December 25th or some other day it's the time of the year that we celebrate the birth Yeah, of nobody knows for sure the exact date that he was born. Yeah. It probably wasn't December 25th, but that's a date that's been chosen. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the thing that always gets me is that we measure time from the birth of Jesus. You know, we used to use uh, B.C. and A.D. Now they say B.C.E. and... and uh, or CE and BCE, Common Era and, and before the Common Era. But where do they start the measurement from? 
from the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus, yeah. You know, it used to be A.D., which yeah. meant uh, Agno Domino, I think, uh, year of the Lord, and then B.C., before Christ. Why they used English for one and Latin for the other, I'm not sure. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the way they used to do it. They Just because people try to try to get rid of Jesus, uh, they went to, like, say, the B.C.E. and C.E., but they still measure it from the same time. Yeah. When did the common era start? When Jesus was born. And so we're in the 2022nd, almost 23rd year since his birth. Uh, some scholars say it may be off a year or two, but it's still, it's basically based upon his birth. So that's, uh, that just shows the importance of that birth. Yeah. Again, there's a lot of, Babies been born, billions of babies been born over the years, and certainly we, you know, ever most ever parent celebrates the birth of a child, but <clears throat> this is a child that was like no other child, and this is a child that can change your life if he hasn't already, and uh, that he came for the purpose of setting us free. And that's what we're going to talk about here, right? Start, that's a good introduction into Galatians 5. Okay. Because <laughs> he said it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's what Jesus came for, to mm -hmm. set us free. To yes. set us free from what? To set us free from the bondage of sin. To set us free from habits and things that have been controlling our lives for years. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, if you're prison and he's going to set you free from that uh, prison cell automa automatically or uh, from other physical afflictions but the one thing that he does set us free from is freedom from bondage to sin and he says he says here stand firm then and don't let yourself do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery of course as we've been talking about in Galatians or about the book of Galatians, these people were wanting to go back into the Old Testament uh, law again. Well, you you know, it's fine. You can accept Jesus, uh, believe in Jesus, but you've also got to be circumcised. You've got to follow the Old Testament law and all the sacrifices and so forth. He says, don't let, don't go back into that. Now, as Christians, we don't do that so much. We don't go back in or don't go into um, the circumcision and the other uh, things maybe that the Jews did, but we can let ourselves be drawn back into the fact that, well, to be saved, you've got to follow a bunch of rules and regulations. For God to love you, you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do that. No, God loves us no matter what. That's right. And the Bible says nothing can separate us from that love. He's going to love us no matter what. Yes. But once we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become his child. And, and certainly we should start uh, doing things differently, you know, living a better life yes. because we are his child, but we don't do those things. And we've said this several times. We'll keep repeating it. You don't do those things to become his child. You become those things because you are his child once you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So don't let people draw you back into, well, that's fine, you know, that you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, but have you quit doing this? Have you quit doing that? Well, have you started doing this? Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you praying every day? Uh, and again, those things are good things, but that's not what ingratiates you or brings you into God's favor. It's your faith in what Jesus did on the cross. It goes on, it says, and mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the whole law. Now, I know a lot of uh, people, especially in this country, I don't know how it is in other countries, but a lot of uh, men are circumcised as babies because of health reasons. It has nothing to do with religious purpose. And that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about if you feel that you have to be circumcised to be right with God, to be in right standing with God, then said Christ will be of no value. 
Christ died for nothing. If you have to do all these other things, then Christ went to the cross for nothing. But the truth is he didn't go to the cross for nothing because all these other things, circumcision and following the Old Testament law, even baptism. Some people will try and tell you, well, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Now, again, I feel everybody, every believer should be baptized, but it's not baptism that saves you. Baptism is just a recognition of what has already happened. The death and the burial, resurrection, as it says in uh, Romans 6, you know, when you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into his death and then raised up into the newness of life. It's it just uh, like a public declaration of that uh, faith that you have, of that commitment that you made, that you were in Christ. So he's talking here about when you let your, if a person lets himself be circumcised mm -hmm. as an obligation to mm -hmm. be, uh, be right with God. He said, if that's true, then you have to obey, obey a oh, whole law, yeah. the whole law. It says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. Grace is just God's unmerited favor. It's also God's ability, God's power within us to do what God's called us to do. But yeah. if we start saying, well, you've got to do this and you've got to do that, then you're not living under God's grace anymore. You're living under the law. It says for Verse 5, for through, for through the uh, Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It just, as long as your faith is not in that, your faith has to be in what? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And then it says that faith is expressed by love, by showing your love to people. First of yeah. all, showing your love to God, your gratitude to God for what he's done. And, and that's why we do, do the right thing. Not to make ourselves right with God, but because we are right with God. We've been yeah. made right by what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we start you know, changing our life, trying to do the right thing. But it's faith in Christ, not faith in our good works, not faith in circumcision, not faith in the fact that we go to church every Sunday, not faith in the fact that we read the Bible every day. And again, those things are good things to do, but our faith is in what? In Christ. It is in Christ. In Christ. And he says... Uh, again, he's talking to these Galatians. says, you were running a good race. You were doing good. You know, things were coming along good. You listened to what I preached. Paul had been preaching to these guys sometime before and uh, told them the truth, and they seemed to accept the truth. And But now he says, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? He says, that, that kind of persuasion did not come from the one who calls you. didn't come from Christ. didn't come from Paul or Anybody else that was preaching the word of God. And then he talks about yeast. Yeah, it says a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. If you've done any bacon, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of yeast to get dough to rise. You know, you put in, I don't know, what do you put in? A couple of tablespoons or? I don't know. I go to the store. <laughs> you go to <laughs> the store and buy your bread. You don't make your bread. No. But you don't put in very much yeast. <laughs> with a whole lot of flour and milk and all the other ingredients, but just that little bit of yeast, it begins to expand, begins to grow, and pretty soon it raises up that dough. What he's saying here, what he's saying here is it doesn't take much. Uh, a little bit of false teaching yeah. uh, can spread throughout the church. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm confident in the Lord that you'll take no other view. In spite of all he'd been saying, you know, he, Paul says, I'm confident, though. I just believe, you know, another place I believe it's in Colossians where it says that uh, God is able to complete um, the, the good work that he started in each of us. And so Paul's saying, yeah, I'm confident, even though you guys have been kind of messing up, kind of going off, I'm confident that, that you're going to come back around. 
He says, the one who's throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. There's a penalty to pay, be paid by false teachers, teach, teach people that are teaching, you know, false doctrine, and especially when they know, you know, that that's yeah. the false doctrine. You know, I, it's easy, you know, to get, uh, how is that, to make mistakes, you know, when you're teaching, and sometimes you might mm -hmm. uh, feel or think one way, but as you begin to grow in the Lord, you begin to, to, you know, change your way of thinking. You begin to see things differently. But this talking about people that are deliberately trying to lead you astray. And these yeah. these people that were uh, talking to these or t teaching these uh, Galatians, they were deliberately trying to lead them astray. And it talks a little bit later about uh, why they were trying to do that. But, <clears throat> but he goes on in verse 11, says, Brothers and sisters, if I were still, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. In other words, if I was still teaching the Jewish teachings, I wouldn't be persecuted. Because who's persecuting? Well, mainly it's the Jews that are persecuting him. And if he was still teaching circumcision, uh, as some of the people are saying. Uh, why they were saying that the only thing i can think of is the fact that uh, you might remember in the book of acts that he had uh, timothy circumcised because mm -hmm. timothy's mother was a jew but it was not for uh, the purpose of making him right with god it was just for the purpose of of satisfying the jews so that he could have an inroad into the yeah. Jews because a lot of his teaching, he usually started out in the synagogues when he went to these different places. And they knew it would be very offensive to him if, if Timothy, who was a Jew, was not circumcised. Later on, when they tried to get him to uh, circumcise Titus, who was a Greek, he said he wouldn't do it because he's, he's not a Jew. He doesn't need to be circumcised. The circumcision was just a... a covenant sign with the, with the Jews. It wasn't for the Gentiles. And he said, I wouldn't be persecuted if I was uh, still preaching the Old Testament law, still preaching you had to do all those things. The reason I, he's being persecuted is because he's saying that those things are no longer necessary, that all that matters now is your trust in Jesus. And apparently he's quite stirred up for about this because he said, as for those agitators, as for these people that are stirring up this trouble, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You know, he's... That's pretty strong. Yeah, that's pretty strong words. Tells you how he feels. <laughs> and he goes on and says, you, my brothers and sisters, this is verse 13, mm -hmm. were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. It says, you've been set free. We saw that in the first, first verse of this chapter. Yeah. You've been called into freedom, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. In other words, just because you're under the grace and not un under grace and not under law, that doesn't mean you can just do anything you want to. Again, back in Romans, he addressed that. The end of verse five, the first part of chapter six, or the... Uh, Last part of chapter five, first part of chapter six, he says, uh, "Where grace or where sin abounds, grace abounds even more." He says, so what does that mean? That because you know grace abounds more, where sin abounds more, we should just sin more, so there'd be more grace. <laughs> and he answers that in the first part of verse, uh, chapter six. He said, "God forbid." Don't you know that they were we that are in Christ or baptized into Christ or baptized into His death? We died to that stuff. In other words, just because we're, we're under grace doesn't mean we're free to do whatever we want to do. Uh, we've been set free from those things. So yes. why do you want to go back to those things? It's almost like, uh, you know, you've been paroled from prison, but you want to go back to prison because you're used to that. I just, you know, I know that. I know that style of life and... You know, we ministered an awful yeah. lot in the jail and prison, and, and we did see that. Yeah. Some people, they don't know how. They've been in slavery, you might say, so long that yeah. they don't know how to react in freedom. 
but we need to know how to how to live free, free from sin, free from those yeah. things that hold us back. It's just uh, and and not not indulge the flesh, but we're to serve one another humbly. <clears throat> For the whole the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment: love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. Uh, of course, Jesus talked about this in in. Uh, one of the gospels, I've forgotten right now which one it is, but he uh, was asked what the great commandment is. And of course, the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. Mm -hmm. But the second commandment, he says, is like that. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, another place he says, if you don't love your neighbor, you don't love your brother whom you can see, how can you love God whom you can't see? So love for our neighbor is a, is a good sign of how much we love God. Yeah. But he also says love your neighbor as what? As yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to love other people when you don't love yourself. Yeah. And again, we've run into a lot of people that have a hard time loving themselves. And, you know, I can understand that. Sometimes when you've done a lot of rotten things in your life, it's it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to love yourself. But if you live under self-condemnation yeah. all the time, I can understand that. But what is what is Paul writing right the book of Romans, I believe it's chapter 5, first verse, he says, Thou th th now there's therefore no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And Romans 8 talks about the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of yeah. God. God loves us. He's forgiven us. Yes. And so certainly, you know, we may not love all the things we've done in the past, uh, but we have to come to that place where we love who we are in Christ, not mm -hmm. love our old nature, not love our, our fleshly nature, but we love who we are in Christ, who what Christ has made us. He's made us the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he that knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Yes. If you've accepted Jesus, your Lord and Savior, you are the righteousness of God. You're wearing that righteousness. And he made an exchange. He took our old filthy rags of sin and gave us his beautiful white robes of righteousness. And so we have to come to love ourselves, not in a prideful way, not... You know, like, no, in a godly way. yeah, in a godly way. God, I thank you what you've done in my life. I know I'm not perfect. I know I make mistakes. But God, you you love me enough that you sent Jesus to die for me. Yeah. And if you love me, then I have to love myself. Mm -hmm. And if I love myself, then I can love other people. But if, yeah. I, if I don't love myself, it's, it's awful hard to love other people. <laughs> He said, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. Mm -hmm. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so you're not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Under the Old Testament, basically, they were guided by the law. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. But today, we're not guided by a written law. What are we guided by? By the Spirit. By the Spirit of God. And the more we open ourselves up to God, the more we uh, allow God to come into our lives, the more uh, sensitive we become to that Spirit's leading. He leads us and guides us and directs us and tells us what to do and shows us the right way to go. <clears throat> and if we listen to the Spirit, said we won't gratify the, the desires of the flesh. On the other hand, if we refuse to listen to the Spirit, we continue to do those things that our flesh wants to do without being led, without listening to the Spirit, then uh, we get to a point where we get hard to hear and you might say mm -hmm. it's hard to hear the spirit but as we begin to obey and do what what the spirit tells us to do 
Uh, we get more sensitive to the Spirit. We can hear His voice even better. And it goes on in verse 19, and He basically says what the acts of the flesh are, the works of the flesh. He said they're pretty obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, that just means all kinds of foolishness and, and wild living. Idolatry, uh, and idolatry doesn't just mean worshiping stone or gold idols. It just means putting anything in place of, of God, making anything more important than God. Witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. It says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. People that continue to live in these things, live in that type of life, says they'll not inherit the kingdom of God. But he goes on and he says, but the fruit. Now this he says, but the acts or Another version says the works of the flesh. Uh, now it says, though, this is the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. And how, do fruit, how does fruit come? It just comes as a natural outgrowth of, of, the, of being part of a tree, you might say. Just as uh, Jesus talked about, I believe, in John uh, 15, where it says that, we're, that he's the divine and we're the branches. As long as we're... Connected to him, we'll produce fruit. If we're cut apart from him, we're not going to produce anything yeah. except these works. We'll be involved in these works it talks about up above. And, uh, but but, but we're not going to be producing fruit in our life. The only way we can produce fruit, good fruit, not bad fruit, but good fruit. The only way we can produce good fruit is what? Connected to the vine connected to Jesus, listening to the Spirit. These are the things that the Spirit produces in our lives. And these things develop over a period of time, just like fruit, you know, begins as a flower and slowly you get a little bud and it, then it begins to get bigger and bigger and, and, and until it gets fully ripe. It, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's a process. But again, it's by staying connected to the vine. Mm -hmm. And what is that fruit? Love. We're just talking about uh, the Greek word is agape, which is unconditional love. It doesn't mm -hmm. have anything to do with sexual love or uh, a great like for anything. I mean, we use that love or that word love so casually, you know. We love our favorite baseball team yeah. or football team. We love our favorite food. We love, you know, my car. We love whatever, but this kind of love is talking about a unconditional love. That I want to love it no matter what. And we have that kind of love toward God because God has that kind of love toward us. As I said before, Romans 8, where it says, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from God's love. <clears throat> and so it doesn't matter what we do. We can do all, can make all kinds of mistakes and and God may discipline us, but it doesn't mean he stops loving us. Just like, you know, you as parents, you may discipline your children when they mess up and do wrong things, but you still hopefully love them. Most parents do. Yeah. They still love their kids. And, and, and in fact, the reason they discipline them is because they love them, because they want them to learn uh, the right from wrong. Uh, joy. Uh, true joy, again, comes from God. This is not talking about happiness that depends on circumstances, but this is just talking about a joy that's in your heart all the time, mm -hmm. no matter what the circumstances yeah. are. Because you know your name's written down in the book of life. I mean, what else can, what can bring you more joy than that? To know <laughs> that, you're, that you're destined for heaven. Peace, that peace is... Passes all understanding as it talks about in Philippians. Even when everything's going wrong, it's just a peace. You know, just like Jesus when he was in the boat with his disciples and the storm come up and they're bailing and doing everything they can. And, you know, several of these guys are fishermen. They're not, they're not novices in knowing how to 
handle a boat in a storm, and yet they're panicking, and finally you go over and look and see, you know, what's Jesus doing? Is he bailing with us, and what's he doing? He's over there sleeping. They're going to wake him up. Lord, don't you care that we're dying and we're going to drown? It's like, I don't know. It wasn't even they were asking him for help. Maybe it's just like, if we're going to drown, at least you'd be awake to see us drown. <laughs> I don't know what their thinking was, but <clears throat> he had the perfect peace. Even in the midst of the storm, and we could be the same way, have peace even when everything is, seems to be falling apart. Right. Forbearance, where we're able to uh, be tolerant of people, be tolerant of people's mistakes. And, patience. And, yeah, patience and uh, kindness, being kind to people, goodness. What did uh, Jesus say when the man approached him and says, uh, what must I do, good master? What was his response? There's none good but who? But, but God. Yeah, none good but one, God. And so we inherit that goodness or we get that goodness from God. Faithfulness, being faithful. Yes. First of all, again, being faithful to God, being faithful to our spouses, being faithful to our family, being faithful to our work, whatever, uh, whatever you know, we're involved in. Mm -hmm. Gentleness. Being gentle with people, not beating people over the head when they make mistakes. It's just like God's gentle with us. You know, sometimes he gets a little tough with us, but basically he's gentle with us. Yeah. And finally, self-control, learning to control ourselves. And of course, even there, God helps us to have, you know, control over our, our thoughts and our habits and so forth. Yeah, but, but there has to be, you know, some... Uh, involvement by yourself in, in controlling your appetites, controlling your thoughts. All those things said, against such thing there is no law. These things don't fall under the law. You, you, can't, you can't get these things by following a law. You know, people nowadays, uh, governments try to pass, they pass all kinds of laws trying to get people to act right, but what happens? They just find other ways to get around them, and so you have to make more laws. You know, you say, well, this is wrong, and they say, well, we'll find a loophole to get around that. Well, then you have to pass another law to plug up that loophole, and you can't pass enough laws to produce all these things in your life. All laws do is just tell you when you're doing wrong, and that's basically what uh, Paul was saying about the Old Testament law. Mm -hmm. All it was for was to show you how short you fall short, how much that, or how much you fall short of, of, of doing what God wants us to do. You, you can't pass enough laws to change people's hearts. Only God can change people's hearts. Yeah. And no matter how much circumcision. Uh, is part of the law is not going to change your heart. No, it doesn't change your heart. It all has to do with the flesh. Yeah. <clears throat> and even the even the rules. Uh, yeah, that's Jesus or Paul talks about <clears throat> having your heart circumcised. Means cutting away the fleshy part of your heart and and uh, being led by the Spirit. Yeah. But uh, the law doesn't change a person. You know, it might. Uh, might change their way of behaving, but it doesn't change their heart. Mm -hmm. You know, if you like speeding and they set up a, a law that says, well, you can't drive over this, you may obey it because you don't want to go to jail or you don't want to get an expensive ticket, but that's not going to stop you from loving to speed. And first chance you get, what are you going to do? You get out where they know there's no policeman or anything, you're going to speed. <clears throat> and again, any, any law like that. Uh, law says you shall not steal. Well, you don't want to go to jail or get in trouble for stealing something, but the first chance you get when um, you know nobody's going to see you stealing it and you know that there's no chance of getting caught, well, you gonna, if you got a heart to steal, you're still going to steal. Yeah, a thief will steal. Yeah, you, you're not, the law can't change that. The only thing that can change that is a change of heart. And what does? who does that? That's God, Jesus, Jesus yeah. <clears throat> They're the only ones that can change your heart. 
And it goes on in verse 24. It says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. In other words, with God's help, with the help of Jesus, we've crucified that old nature. We've we crucified that desire. To, yeah, we start giving desires. into it. But yeah. <clears throat> again, it's with it's with his help. It's not yeah. just our own willpower. If we right. could do it by our own willpower, then we wouldn't have Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross. But he's the one that helps us mm -hmm. the, to crucify, to put those things to to death, those old desires to you know, for things he talks about there, for sexual immorality and impurity and debauchery and idolatry and all those things. He said, God puts helps you put those things to death. Mm -hmm. And again, it's we have to cooperate. You know, we can resist the spirit. As it says there earlier, you know, there's a there's a struggle between the spirit and the flesh. Yeah. You know, our flesh still sometimes wants things that we know are not good for us or are not right. But as we yield to the Spirit, mm -hmm. God's Spirit begins to work in our heart and take those desires away from us, replace them with the right desires, and replaces them with uh, desires to do good. Turns our hatred into love, turns our, uh, our, our lust into love, and all of these things that God, only God can do. God's the only one that can truly do those things. But again, we have to cooperate with him. We have to yield to the Spirit. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step, step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So <clears throat> as God begins to work in our lives, let's not get conceited and think, well, I'm pretty good, you know, <laughs> I'm... Uh, I've, I've broken a lot. I've quit a lot of my bad habits, you know. I'm uh -oh. getting to be a pretty good guy. Or on the other hand, says provoking or envying, envying other people. Wow, you know, God must love that person more than me because, you know, God's really blessed him and he's, you know, he's got there growing so much faster. And uh, uh, he says those, those aren't, uh, if we're in step with the Spirit, those things aren't, aren't part of our lives. We don't get conceited, think we're more than what we should be or what we are. And on the other hand, we don't envy others that, uh, that seem to be making progress or, or being blessed more than we are. And so these are all things that, that God wants to produce in our lives, these fruit of the Spirit. And it doesn't happen overnight. But if we'll yield to the Spirit, if we'll let God work as all these things can be um, produced in our lives, and I'll tell you, your life is so much better, so much better. So much better. I mean, uh, you know, I've been on both sides of it, and I know it's so much better when we've yielded our lives to God and let Him yeah. be begin to produce these things in our lives and, and start causing fruit to be evident in our lives. It just reminds me of the orange tree that you you planted out back. It took a long time for that orange tree to produce fruit, but yep. it had to do its own producing. You couldn't be out there yep. trying to produce fruit for it. <laughs> I just stood out there and strained all I wanted, but it didn't, it didn't help. It had to produce by being attached to the yeah. Uh, and if I'd cut off that branch and had the little buds on it, you know, they, oh, I'll cut that off and I'll <laughs> accelerate its growth. All I would have done was kill it. Yeah. And that's sometimes what we do, you know. Yeah. We try to take things into our own hands and, and all that does is is uh, stop the work of the stop Lord. The work. Yeah. yeah, but we have to keep yeah. stay connected to him and realize that it's Jesus working in us. And thank you. God, it is Jesus working in us because that takes the struggle out of yeah. out of us trying to be um, perfect or right in God's sight oh. in our own way. Yeah, well, that's so what Paul's talking what about Paul, here. Yeah, Paul's he's talking about thing. all you Galatians. You're you're you know you started out good. You believed mm -hmm. me about Jesus. You believed when I taught about Jesus yeah. and He's your Savior and. Yeah. And now somebody's come along and say, well, you know, that's not enough. You yeah. got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do that. Uh -huh. And um, 
again, there's nothing wrong with some of those things that he's saying to do. I mean, certainly the law, especially the moral law, the Ten Commandments, those are good, those are good things, things to do. But you can do those at least to the best of your ability. Nobody can follow those completely, especially when you realize the the the, the, the spirit of the law. Yeah, when Jesus said, you know, if you've hated your brother, you've already guilty of murder. If you've yeah. lusted after a woman, you've already guilty. You're already guilty of adultery. And uh, you know, by extrapolation, you say if you've ever thought about wanting, you know, ever wanted to steal something from somebody, mm -hmm. even if you didn't do it, you're still guilty of of stealing. Uh, when you realize the the spirit behind the law then nobody yeah. nobody can follow that nobody can do can do that on their own but when jesus went to the cross he paid the price he paid the he price for did. our sin he paid it completely he Thank said you, it's finished it's finished Thank the work you, of god jesus. is finished now all we have to do is accept it yeah you know jesus the word says that jesus yes. died for the <clears throat> sins of the world in fact, in that same uh, scripture where it talks about Jesus uh, who knew no sin became sin, right before that it talks about God's not holding the sins of the world against them. Mm -hmm. God's not standing up there holding the sins of the world against He's back He's Romans. paid them. Yeah, back in no, it's 2 Corinthians. Oh. He's already paid the price. The only, who's holding the sin against, against us? We are. Mm -hmm. Because we refuse to accept God's forgiveness. We refuse to accept what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. And, and God, I believe that saddens God because they, it didn't do, I mean, Jesus going to the cross didn't do any good because for you anyway because you didn't accept it. <clears throat> so let's not let that be, let's not let Jesus' sacrifice be a waste in our lives. It certainly wasn't a waste for mankind. I'm not saying that, but it can be a waste in your life if you don't accept it. If you don't accept that forgiveness, then Jesus going to the cross didn't do anything for you. But it's by accepting that and letting him come into your heart and begin to change you. <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, we thank you, for Lord, for the fact that Jesus did come. He came as a baby, but he grew up. He showed us a way to live. He taught us how to live, Lord. But then finally he went to that cross. He was willing to sacrifice himself, even in spite of all the pain and agony that he knew he would have to go through and, and the, the spiritual suffering, the being rejected, being having the wrath of God poured out upon him. And yet he said, Father, not my will, but yours. And may we have the same spirit father not our wills but your will be done on this earth father i want your will to be done in my life and i pray that those that are listening lord would have the same attitude that you they would submit to your will because your will is only for good father you never uh, want uh, bad thing you never want evil for us father but you only want good and so father i pray that those that are listening today would be uh, stirred by your word, Father. And if they haven't come to that place of receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day, Father. And for those that have accepted him, Lord, help them to stay free from going back under the law, going back under rules and regulations, Father, but to be free to follow after the Spirit and let the Spirit just guide their lives, Father. We give you praise and thanks in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we got one more chapter. Um, uh -huh. We'll see. if we, we may do this next week or we may wait till after the first of the year. We'll see. You check in next week, and if we're here, fine. If we're not, <laughs> then check back the first of the year. We'll see how things are going next week, being between Christmas and New Year's. Yeah, but, it's uh, going to be a busy week. Yeah, it's going to be a busy week, so we'll see how yeah. things go. But if we don't finish it next Wednesday, the, uh, we'll finish it the first Wednesday of the, of the new year. Uh, so it'll soon be 2023.
Oh, Alpine flies. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. we got something. You got something out of this, and uh, you just oh. have a blessed Christmas. And we're going to have a service on Christmas Eve night. Yes, six for those of you that uh, go to Zion Church, or for even if you don't, if you six don't have seven. a church home, mm -hmm. we're going to have a Christmas Eve service from six to seven mm -hmm. at the church, and uh, we won't be having Christmas day service. That's right. We just want to let families have time together mm -hmm. on Christmas day. So hopefully we'll see you there. Yeah. Be blessed. God bless you.